So in this problem, we're dealing with a wave that is inside the infinite square well, and then we're told that it has an initial wave function that is equal to some constant a times sine to the power of 3 n pi x divided by a. So the first thing we want to do is that we want to find the wave function as a function of time as well. So this is the initial wave function. Now we want to find how the function would evolve as time goes on. So we need to find the wave function with a t as well. So this is what this video is going to be focused on. I'm going to find the expected value of x in the next video. So we're going to focus on this in this video. So one thing I uh, should note is that uh, here are the things that you need to know about the infinite square well. So this is what the, each of the stationary states, uh, what, what form the stationary states take on. So for the n stationary state, xi of n is equal to this expression. So this is all derived in the examples in the book. And then if we want to find the wave function as function of x and as a function of time, the wave function would take on a general form that looks something like this. So in the end, what's important is that we need to find what these constants c and should be. So now we're given an initial wave function. What we need to do is that we need to express the initial wave function as a linear combination of the stationary states. So we need to find what these constants c and should be such that the initial wave function is equal to this summation over here on the right hand side. And once we find these constants cn, we can just tack on this e to the power of negative i e n t divided by h bar term. So this is the time term. So once you attach this uh, to this expression over here, you would get your wave function. And so ultimately, our goal is to find what these constants cn should be. So we're given an initial wave function. We know what the stationary states are for the, uh, for the n stationary state. And now we need to find what cn should be in order for this equation to be true. Once we find what cn should be, we can uh, substitute cn within this formula, and this would give us the complete wave function. So that's what we're going to do. So our initial wave function, we you know, is equal to a times sine to the power of 3 pi x divided by a. So one thing I'm, I'm going to do is that I'm going to decompose this sine to the power of 3 term. So I'm going to use this uh, identity over here. So sine 3 theta is actually equal to 3 sine theta minus 4 sine to the power of 3 theta. So you can easily prove this by applying the double angle formula multiple times. So I'm not going to go through the proof over here, or you can just look this up yourself. But uh, So the point is, uh, we can decompose a sine, to the, uh, sine 3 theta into uh, such a term. And so that means sine 3 pi x divided by a is actually equal to 3 sine pi x divided by a minus 4 sine to the power of 3 pi x over a. So you can see that I'm just using this formula over here where theta is uh, being treated as being equal to pi x over a. And so you can see that with a bit of rearranging, sine to the power of 3 pi x over a is actually equal to 3 over 4 sine pi x over a, and then minus 1 over 4, sine 3 pi x over a. So this is how you can decompose the sine to the power of 3 term. You can decompose it into something like this. So that means for our initial wave function, I can now express it as something like this. So it's some constant a times 3 over 4 sine pi x over a, and then minus 1 over 4 times sine 3 pi x over a. And so there we have it. And uh, now one thing I'm going to do is that I'm going to, instead of writing out everything as sine, uh, using the sine symbol, I'm actually going to use uh, uh, xi, uh, xi of n instead. So we know that sine pi x over a, if I attach square root of 2 over a in front of this sine term, this would actually be equal to xi of 1. So you can, you can just check this formula. If xi of 1, it's equal to square root of 2 over a times sine pi x over a, which is exactly what we have over here. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to attach a square root of 2 over a in front of the sine, and I can't just attach this term out of nowhere. I need to cancel it out as well. So I'm also going to multiply this by square root of a over 2. And then I'm going to do the same thing for this sine term over here. So square root of 2 over a, and then square root of a over 2. And then once I do this, I can now express everything in such a form. So I'm just, I'm just going to pull this square root of a over 2 to the outside, and then I'll have 3 over 4, so this 3 over 4, 
and the square root of 2 over a combines with the sine term to give me to give me psi 1. And then over here I'm going to do, do the same, so uh, this term is pulled to the outside of the bracket, I have a negative 1 fourth, and then this term over here will be psi of 3. And so now I have expressed uh, the initial wave function in terms of the stationary states. So now there is one thing left for us to do. We need to find what the constant a should be. So a is a constant uh, such that this initial wave function is normalized. So if I integrate the initial wave function, I should get a result that is equal to 1, so psi 3x. So in order to normalize our wave function, I know that if I not integrate my wave function, then this should be equal to 1. And then I know that uh, for the initial wave function, the initial wave function actually only takes on this value within this region 0 to a. So outside of the uh, infinite square, well, so when x is smaller than 0 and x is larger than a, the initial wave function is going to be 0. And so that is why for this integral, I can just change the bounds to go from 0 to a instead. And then for the absolute value square of the initial wave function, all I can do, uh, all I'm going to do is just I'm going to take the initial, uh, the absolute value square of all this. So that means I have an absolute value square of the constant a, and I also need to square this, a over two, and then I also need to uh, square this term over here. So three over four, xi one of x minus one fourth, xi three x and then absolute value squared dx. So this integral should be equal to 1. And so now I'm just going to pull this absolute value of square a to the outside, a over 2, and then expanding this term over here, what you're going to get is uh, 9 over 16, xi 1 x squared, and then 1 over 16, xi 3 x squared, and then for the other terms, you, you see that be, you have these cross terms. You have a term where you have xi1 conjugate times xi3, and you also have a term where you have xi3 conjugate times xi1. So that's going to be inside the integral as well, but I'm not going to write those out because uh, these stationary states are actually orthogonal to each other. So that's why if you take this integral, what you're going to get is going to be equal to zero. So if you take the conjugate of xi1 and then multiply by xi3 and then integrate it, what you're going to get is 1. And the same for this term over here. So I'm not going to write those terms out because they're just going to be equal to 0. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to write these terms out and then dx. And then these stationary states themselves, they are all normalized. So if I take this integral, both of these terms will just be equal to 1. So in the end, I have the absolute value of a squared times a over 2. And then since uh, this is going to be equal to 1, so you just have 9 over 16 plus 1 over 16. So this is just 10 over 16, and then divided by 2, that's 5 over 16. So we have a times 5 over 16 times the absolute value of uh, square of a, and then we know that this term is actually equal to 1. And so now we see that the absolute value of a square, I can just dump these terms over to the other side, I have 16 divided by 5a. And so this implies that a is equal to 4 divided by the square root of 5a. So this is the normalization constant. So what this means is that our initial wave function can now be written in such a form. So a is actually going to be equal to 4 divided by the square root of 5a. And then we have a square root of a over 2. And then we have this, the stationary states. 3 over 4, xi 1x minus 1 over 4, xi 3 of x. And then with a bit of rearranging, you can see that uh, these conveniently cancel out. The 4 can go inside the bracket, it cancels everything out. And in the denominator, you have the 1 over the square root, uh, you have the square root of 10. And then I can just put that inside the bracket. So in the end, you have 3 divided by the square root of 10, xi 1 of x, and then minus 1 divided by the square root of 10, xi 3 of x. And so this is another way of writing out your initial wave function. And you can see that we're actually almost done because our goal here in this video is to find what the wave function should be. And in order to do this, we need to find these constants Cn. And then we can find these constants Cn by considering this term over here. We need to match the initial wave function. We need to uh, convert the initial wave function into such a term. We need to convert it into a linear combination of the stationary states. And you can see that we have 
express the initial wave function as a linear combination of the stationary states. So if you can compare this term that we have over here with the summation over here, you can see that this is actually just a case where c1 is equal to 3 divided by the square root of 10, c2 is equal to 0, c3 is equal to negative 1 divided by the square root of 10, and then c4, uh, c5, and so on, all the rest of the constants, they're all equal to 0. And so you can see that we have actually managed to find the initial wave function as a linear combination of the stationary states, and then we have found the CNs. We know that uh, c2, c4, and all the rest, they're all equal to 0, and the c1 and c3, they take on these two respective values. And so now we're basically pretty much done. So recall that what we want to do is to find the uh, wave function, which we know can be expressed in such a form. And we know that when n is equal to 2, 4, 5, and so on, all the way to infinity, they're all 0, so we can just omit those. So in the end, only c1, so only the n is equal to one term, and c3 remain. So e to the power of negative i e3 t divided by h bar. And now we can, we're can we pretty much done. So this is your wave function. And we can just now substitute in c1 and c3. So we know that c1 is equal to 3 divided by the square root of 10. So times xi1 times e to the power of negative i e1 t divided by h bar. And then c3 is just negative 1 divided by the square root of 10. So negative 1 divided by the square root of 10 xi3 e to the power of negative i e3 t divided by h bar. And so this is your answer. This is the wave function. So what all this means is that if we have a, uh, a particle that has an initial wave function uh, that takes on such a form, and then we know that this particle exists inside an infinite square well, if I want to find the wave function, at another point in time, at time t. So this is what the wave function looks like at time 0. If I want to know what the wave function looks at time t for this particle that is inside the infinite square well, uh, you can get your wave function at time t by considering this formula over here.